Hello, Health 230 students. This is Brian Clark. Today I will be going over chapter number two, planning a healthy diet. And chapter two is is very uh, vague. <laughs> um, there's not a lot of specifics. Uh, and, and I think that's okay because we get into a lot of specifics later in this book. But what chapter two does is kind of gives you a 30,000 foot view of everything that you need to consider when planning a diet. So um, as you read through chapter two and as you listen to me talk about the information in chapter two, realize that um, uh, this is a, a very general overview of how we go about planning a healthy diet and that we will get into a lot more specifics later on in class. All right, starting at the beginning of chapter number two, uh, you'll see some information on principles and guidelines. And um, first and foremost there you see adequacy. Adequacy is a term that you'll see a lot in this book. And, and if you uh, read the literature, you'll see it there. And it's simply talking about whether or not food is providing sufficient energy and essential nutrients for health. And we, we don't see foods often, we don't see foods um, having, we don't see them being adequate <laughs> uh, on a regular basis because um, in America, so many of the foods that the general population eats are highly processed. And the more that you process foods, uh, the fewer vitamins and minerals are in there, and you have a tendency to get what we call empty calories. And those empty calories, they're not adequate because they're not providing 100% of the recommended daily allowance for vitamins and minerals for a person's body to function correctly. Balance, that's simply referring to whether or not a person is consuming the right proportions of food. Kilo calorie control, and this is a big one in our society. Uh, if you look at the data, it very clearly shows that we as a society are gaining weight, that our body fat percentage is going up, in particular over the last 25 years, that body fat percentage has increased dramatically. And that puts us at risk for diseases like diabetes type 2, certain types of cancer, cardiovascular disease, which of course leads to heart attacks and strokes. And when you consider how prevalent those diseases already are in our society, heck, cardiovascular disease, which is the is still the leading cause of death in America, it is almost exclusively lifestyle related. And when you look at the data, uh, you, you see very quickly that we are progressively becoming more sedentary and that we're progressively uh, e eating more in relationship to the amount of activity that we're doing which means that our body fat percentage goes up and that's scary that's scary information when you think about where um, where the trends are going or what the trend will be as it relates to the incidence of cardiovascular disease, the incidence of certain types of cancer in, including colorectal breast cancer um, and, uh, and and lastly, the biggie, di diabetes type 2. Uh, the next item there, nutrient density. And nutrient density, that is a measurement of the nutrient content of a food relative to its energy content. And I touched on that just a moment ago, um, that, that foods that we as a society tend to eat, they, they tend to be very energy rich but nutrient poor. And um, and thus they they are empty calories. Uh, the next bullet item there, moderation. Uh, that's that was pretty that was pretty straightforward. Um, moderation is just simply talking about a person eating certain foods uh, in moderation. <laughs> I don't think that one that that one doesn't need any further explanation. Um, and lastly there variety and and this one does deserve um deserve some attention and deserves us thinking about this uh as we as we go forward in this chapter and ultimately in this text that there is a, an enormous array of foods that we can potentially eat uh, when you go into the grocery store uh, I, I ask you to do this please when you go into the grocery store next time slowly walk through the vegetable and fruit area, the produce area. And just look. Look at all the different vegetables that are there. Look at all the different fruits are there, that are there. And you will notice that there is a very wide selection 
a very large variety of foods that we can potentially eat. However, when you look at the normal American diet, <laughs> you see very few of those food items showing up on a regular basis. People like to eat out. They like to eat boxed meals. Uh, their, their foods are very highly processed. And yes, it may be easier to, um, to to pour something out of a can or out of a box, and or for that matter, just pop something in the microwave and have dinner. But um, it, it's safe to say that, um, you know, that there's going to be a lot of empty calories that you're not getting. Uh, you know, th th those foods are not adequate. You know, that goes back to that term adequacy that we were talking about earlier. Um, so. Hopefully, as you take this class, you're going to start thinking about variety and the fact that you have the ability to eat a variety of foods and that as a future clinician, more than likely, um, because I know many of you all are in the, the health field, that you have the ability to make recommendations, very specific recommendations to patients on the types of foods that they ingest. And in the interest of time, I'm going to flip over here and see how far along we are. All right. Um, continuing on, Dietary Guidelines for Americans. And these are published by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, or HHS, uh, as well as the U, uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture, or USDA. And um, you'll, you'll see those through, throughout the text, the, the Dietary Guidelines. And uh, there, there are a lot of those. Um, some of those relate to physical activity, and generally speaking, they are going to recommend that we increase the amount of physical activity that we that we do, which will of course increase the energy expenditure. expenditure. Um, that those those activities should be aerobic in nature to condition the cardiovascular system. Uh, those types of activities would be things like. Um, high intensity walking or running or cycling things that a person can do over an extended period of time that that will get the heart rate up <clears throat> and um, many of those guidelines will also encourage um, encourage us to choose from from a variety of food groups and there is a lot of value in that and we'll talk about an, an analogy here in a few minutes that relates to that. Uh, those dietary guidelines are also going to recommend that you limit fats, in particular, in particular limit saturated fats and cholesterol and, and most definitely trans fats. And luckily we're in a society now where a lot of people realize how harmful trans fats can be. And um, some, some cities have even, um, have even forbidden trans fats to be sold. So, um, let, let's hope we continue to move in that direction because trans fats are very dangerous and dramatically increase a person's risk for cardiovascular disease. So um, ideally we want to be choosing foods that are low in saturated fat and trans fat and, um, uh, and I, don't, I don't want to say necessarily high but um, the, the, the fats are coming from mono unsaturated and poly unsaturated fat sources. Carbohydrates, uh, ideally the carbohydrates that we do ingest should be high in fiber. Uh, we live in a society where you all oftentimes hear about how evil carbohydrates are, but fruits and vegetables are carb carbohydrates, and I assure you they are not they are not evil. They are not um, they, they are not de detrimental to your health. However, um, sugar, sucrose, which is the primary ingredient uh, found in things like soda, uh, candy bars. Um, even though that is a carbohydrate, yeah, it's safe to say that that is detrimental to your health, especially when ingested in large volumes. So ideally carbohydrates need to be those that are high in fiber, like vegetables and fruit. <clears throat> and um, yeah, the last bullet point there, uh, if you're eating foods that are low in sucrose or low in table sugar, that's going to re reduce your risk of dental bacteria, and ultimately that's going to um, 
It's going to foster dental health. You're not going to have as many cavities. Sodium and potassium. Most people know so large amounts of sodium. That's not good for your blood pressure. Alcoholic beverages, so long as you're drinking in moderation. Um, there, there really are minimal adverse effects from alcohol. And actually, in, in certain cases, if you truly are drinking in moderation, there, there even are some cardiovascular benefits. Food safety, I'm not going to talk much about that later now because we're going to talk a whole bunch about that later. There's also going to be information in Chapter 2 on diet, plan, diet planning guides. And um, those are structured plans that people can follow that, that indicate what foods they should be ingesting. And um, some people need that. In, in particular, patients need that on a regular basis. They need a diet plan. And there's going to be a couple chapters that we'll talk about later in the book that, um, that very specifically do diet planning for the patient population. And in particular, what we're going to look at is what the job is of a dietitian. Or maybe a better way of saying that is we're going to look at what a dietitian does in a clinical setting and they they have a very specific job um, and um, and one that in in my opinion is um, is valuable is extremely valuable because if patients aren't are not eating the right foods they're not providing the right building blocks and they're not, they're not putting themselves in a position to to heal their bodies the USDA food guide assigns foods to the five major food groups those include fruits vegetables grains meat and legumes and milk. The food guide is also going to make recommendations about amounts and um, the recommended intake of each food group depends upon your personal physical activity level and there's some really neat online resources now that take that into consideration and all you have to do is enter some of your demographic information in there, things like um, your, your age, uh, your activity level, and uh, then those guides are going to make recommendations for the amounts of each food group that you should be ingesting. And uh, variety should always be a goal. This is table 2-3 that you'll see in your text. And this is a very general recommendation about how many cups of vegetables, fruits, grains, meats, and legumes, milks, and oils that you should be ingesting in a given day based upon your uh, caloric expenditure. So for me, um, I'm probably in this 2200 per day category. That's this table, which is based upon uh, the, uh, the food guide. All right, I'm going to call it quits right here because I am certainly going to need to do two lectures on Chapter 2 here. I'm not going to be able to get finished in that 15 minute window, that 15 minute YouTube window. So we will pick back up talking about recommended daily amounts from each food group.